Good morning, everyone. Um, thank you very much for joining us today on this lovely Wednesday morning. My name is Alexia, and I have the pleasure of being a panel today, um, your chair today, excuse me. And with me, I've got um, four incredible panelists who will be talking to us about um, going beyond net zero and really thinking about pushing the boundaries um, when it comes to sustainability. So this webinar is being um, kindly hosted by SIBSI and by ACOM, and it's really here to celebrate um, the launch of the updated um, uh, SIBSI Guidance L, um, which really looks, again, at a holistic design um, input for, for sustainable buildings. So just a bit of um, housekeeping before we start. This event, event is being recorded and a link will be accessible at a later date. Um, the way it will work is that we'll spend the first half hour or so going or listening to our panelists talk about um, their, their um, input on Beyond Net Zero. And then the second half will be spent really um, opening up the forum to get your questions and to, to hear from yourselves um, about anything that you would like to, to ask the panelists. So if you have any questions, please do feel free to drop them into um, the question box at any point during the webinar. And if you've got anyone that you would like to address this to in particular, please do feel free to do so. And if not, I'll just open it up for, for the discussion. So today with me, I've got Anne Robinson from the GLA, Julie and Goodfroy from SIBSI, um, Clarice from um, Cardiff University and uh, Dave Cheshire from ACOM. And um, I'll let them introduce themselves in due time. But before we kind of jump into it, I thought I'd spend the first five minutes or so talking about what um, sustainability means and what net carbon um, and beyond means from, from a client's perspective. So I work for Landsec and Landsec has been heralding and, and pushing the boundaries in, from sustainability for a number of years now. And we are, you know, we're market leaders in sustainability and we've we spent a number of years forging this position for ourselves. But what we have started to see um, in the last, you know, in, in the recent times, especially in the last couple of years, is the attention and the scrutiny that is being placed on our sustainability agenda is on the rise. Um, and we can no longer, oops, sorry about that. Slide take issues. Um, you know, what we're seeing is that we can no longer really rely on the likes of BREAMs and, and EPCs as, as proof of concept and as sole sustain sustainability metrics, because, you know, we've moved on a long way as an industry from there and our understanding and general awareness of sustainability is on the rise and it is so exponentially. And we're seeing an increased level of scrutiny from tenants, from investors, from analysts, from the general public. And what it, that means for us is that we're having to find new proof points and new ways of demonstrating what we are doing to, to essentially have some, some robustness to our claims. And so from an investment point of view, we're really seeing a large number of institutional investors taking an active stance in this, um, in, this, in this area and signaling to companies that they expect them to reduce their carbon emissions in line with Paris. And we as clients have to rise up to those expectations and really start to push the, the agenda. And so we're really seeing this rise of ESG in the likes of the, the benchmarks I put here on the screen um, becoming increasingly important, which obviously feeds into the, the whole net zero um, agenda. Uh, something that we've also kind of noticed in, in the last couple of years is that this is increasingly acting and, and increasingly benefiting us in, in a way of, of, of customer engagement. You know, we're seeing this as a real opportunity to align with our own customers' ESG ambitions. So, you know, not a day goes by really without a, a company somewhere making some kind of climate commitment or carbon reduction commitment, which is incredible. And especially for knowledge firms, um, it's estimated that real estate and travel are the two largest sources of, of carbon emissions um, for those types of firms. And so as landlords, we have the opportunity to help our customers and our clients um, align um, with their ESG ambitions. And Typically, if you take a, a company that is looking to, to reduce the, the carbon footprint by occupying a low carbon or zero carbon building, um, that feeds into their own agenda. And this is where we're really seeing some um, a, a, a new route to collaboration between the two. And just to put this into context, um, a recent study from JLL um, looked at uh, leasing options in London coming up in, until 2030 and about 100 organizations, over 100 organizations with such ESG ambitions and climate commitments have lease options coming up by then. And that is equivalent to about 8 million square feet of office space in London. And at this current point in time, there is no net zero office available to meet that demand. So we as landlords really have a responsibility um, to deliver and to meet that demand. And so it's, again, really starting to push, push the boundary in that sense. And taking that a step further, we're very acutely aware here at Landsec that we can't do this without the input of our tenants. You know, we can only take operational efficiency so far and the more efficient a building becomes, 
the more it relies on tenant input and tenant level collaboration. Co collaboration. So again, really starting to see new routes of, of collaboration with with our customers, which is something that um, you know the industry has tended to lack in, in the past. So I'll just leave you with this in, in, in the sense that we as clients, I think, have a fundamental role to play in moving the industry forward. We need to be setting the right briefs or setting briefs in the first place at the beginning of, of a project which has clear targets, which are set in science and which have a clear and robust methodology. We need to be collaborating with the right partners because sustainability is inherently dependent on the right collaboration between people as you know, there's a bit of a recurring theme here with, with collaboration. And we need to find new ways of rewarding the right behaviors, be it through contracts or other means. And it's something that we're, we're really looking um, into as a company. And I think beyond that, and something I'd encourage you and myself as well to, to, to do as we listen to our panelists today is to really think beyond boundaries. And I think that's something that the, the new guidance, the guidance L from CIPC does really well, is taking that holistic approach and stop not thinking about buildings as individual units, but really as ecosystems within ecosystems. And that opens up a whole wide breadth of, of opportunities. I would say be critical about sustainability claims. You know, again, net zero is the hot is hot on everyone's mouth at the moment, but it can mean a whole load of different things to everyone. So really understand the boundaries that have been set for those claims and the methodology behind those, because we need to be keeping each other accountable for those claims. And then finally, I would say um, engage with your supply chains because you know we're really dependent on them rising up to the challenge as well. And body carbon is a big hot topic as well that we really need to be tackling. And without that engagement with the supply chain, we'll only get so far. And I'll leave you just with this, you know, challenge us, the clients, um, you, Really, you need to be coming to us if you think that our brief isn't good enough or our targets aren't aspirational enough. Please do challenge us and challenge each other. And I'm hoping that you'll challenge us at the end of this um, this session through the queue. So I'll now pass it on to the first panelist of the day, Anne Marie. Good morning, everyone. My name is Anne Marie Robinson. I'm in the climate change team at the Greater London Authority. And we are responsible for the mayor's net zero carbon target for London. I work on the new build aspect, which we are implementing through the London plan. So today I will outline the mayor's uh, key environmental priorities uh, with a particular focus on the new London plan carbon and energy policies, which we've been developing. And I'll then conclude with some of the wider context around planning and the planning system at the moment uh, with the various changes and proposals coming forward which may impact where our net zero targets um, in relation to new build may go in the future. So the mayor has a number of priorities um, in relation to the climate agenda. First of all, um, he has a target for London to be a net zero carbon city with clean transport, energy efficient buildings and a clean energy supply. We also have a target for London to be a zero waste city uh, to have the best air quality of any major city and also to increase uh, green cover significantly. There are also action plans for addressing fuel poverty and increasing solar PV capacity in London and various new funding streams um, to really catalyse action and support these aims, including for our retrofit accelerator programmes. So all of these uh, priorities are captured in the London Environment Strategy featured on the left here. This was the first environment strategy for London, which really combined all policies and actions across uh, the environment agenda, setting out roles uh, for the mayor, as well as for government, businesses, communities, local authorities, and Londoners as well. Um, that sort of collaboration is, is really important to help achieve these goals. Um, I think it's important to point out as well that uh, these priorities, I think in recent months, um, are sort of becoming in, even more important um, and are taking a really important position in the mayor's plans for recovery to make sure that it's a uh, green recovery from the pandemic. And all of the, the recovery work uh, is summed up in a series of missions, um, which are publicly available now for comment and include a Green New Deal for London with net zero carbon buildings being a key component of that. The other documents featured here, um, in the middle we have our 1.5 degrees C climate action plan, which underpins the zero carbon target for the city, outlining various pathways to achieve it. This is compliant with the highest ambition of the Paris Agreement. And finally, the London plan, which I will talk about um, in a bit more detail now. So this is the, the London plan is the spatial development strategy for London, which all local plans 
should be in conformity with. Planning has a, a really important role in the climate emergency, which we have tried to frame the London plan in the context of. The intent to publish version of the plan is available and we're expecting it to be adopted shortly. I don't have a date at this point that I can share. Um, it's still pending directions from the Secretary of State in certain areas, although not our energy and carbon policies. So we're still waiting for formal approval of that. The approach we took uh, with the new London plan carbon and energy policies was to really look at where we were with the current plan and identify ways in which we could really accelerate progress in emissions reductions and identify the gaps that we needed to fill. So just to outline those for you here, and this is all in the context of the existing Be Lean, Be Clean, Be Green um, energy hierarchy. So uh, the new plan now has a, a zero carbon target, a net zero carbon target for all major developments, including non-residential development, building on our existing zero carbon homes target that's been in place since 2016. So that in practice is the minimum 35% carbon improvement on national building regs with the remainder offset through a contribution to each borough's carbon offset fund based on either the GLA's uh, recommended cost of carbon or a price set locally by the borough. And we, we do monitoring of those, of those funds as well in terms of how much money is coming in and, and what it's being spent on. We have also increased the offset price to £95 a tonne from the current £60 a tonne. That's really to incentivise um, on-site emission reductions even further. Offsetting does have a role to play at the moment, although that should diminish over time. Um, and it really allows for those offset funds to be used to tackle some of the more challenging aspects of decarbonising each borough, in particular on the retrofit side of things. We have also set for the first time new energy efficiency targets. And um, this is really to promote the fabric first approach. Uh, so we have a 10% improvement on uh, national building regs for residential developments and a 15% carbon improvement for non-residential developments. And we're actually already starting to see some, some encouraging progress towards those targets in the monitoring that we undertake. We are also continuing to promote delivery of heat networks through the plan with an expectation for new developments to connect to heat networks um, if they're in a heat network priority area. And we're also continuing to encourage the uptake of renewable technologies uh, such as solar PV and heat pumps. For the next uh, part of the plan, I wanted to take you through um, two really quite new and significant aspects of the policy to really drive low carbon design and ensure buildings uh, are being built that achieve the carbon emission reductions that they're, that they're intended to. The first of these to take you through is our new requirement for all planning applications, which are referred to the mayor, to calculate and reduce whole life cycle carbon emissions. This is really based on the need to understand and reduce uh, embodied carbon, not just operational emissions. We know that the, the building and construction sector accounts for, is responsible for 39% of carbon emissions. So we need to start fully capturing that impact and the total carbon footprint of, of what's being built throughout the building's lifetime. We know that operational emissions are going to make up a declining proportion of that total carbon footprint um, as operational uh, emission targets are, are tightened and, and grow stronger. And that's re represented by the, the green segments of the, the pie chart set out here. Uh, there's also a wide range of activity going on um, to establish methods and approaches, uh, not just in London, but in cities uh, worldwide. And we've also got the Committee on Climate Change really calling on government to establish a framework to assess whole life cycle carbon emissions. So in London, we're, we're really taking this forward by, by introducing this new policy and publishing supporting guidance and a reporting template, uh, which was informed with technical support from Cundall and Targeting Zero. In terms of the scope of the, um, our definition of whole life cycle emissions, this sets it out quite broadly. Uh, it really is a, a whole life cycle approach, capturing emissions uh, right from raw material extraction, manufacturing transport of materials through construction, the operational elements of the site, through to maintenance, repair, repair and replacement emissions, and finally dismantling uh, demolition and eventual material disposal. The guidance um, that we've published explains how to comply with this policy, the information required at pre-application, planning application submission, and also post-construction as well, which is a really important element of this. And also um, our guidance include benchmarks against which to compare each development. We're actually starting to see um, whole life cycle carbon assessments come through now, and are actually really encouraged by other local authorities outside London who are planning to adopt uh, similar policies and guidance. So there's a lot of momentum out there on this at the moment. 
And what we're, we're really trying to achieve here um, is a more consistent and comprehensive approach um, to really inform building design, encouraging the reuse of existing materials and structures, encouraging durable uh, construction as well, and flexible design. So we've got greater building longevity from, from what we're building. Our draft guidance and template have been available in just in draft form since April, but we'll be uh, taking those out to formal consultation, which should happen uh, next week. So the final aspect of the new London plan policy is um, our new Be Seen energy monitoring policy. Um, this is a fairly ambitious new, new area for us um, to really support our net zero carbon target. And it's uh, what we've done is added a fourth element to our Be Lean, Be Clean, Be Green energy hierarchy with our Be Seen uh, element, which will require all major developments to monitor and report their energy performance post-construction and report to the mayor via, via a public online portal. If we're really going to achieve net zero carbon buildings, we need to we need to bridge the performance gap and make sure buildings are performing as efficiently as they're intended to. So measuring and understanding this gap is really critical in, in closing it and also to inform future policy direction around metrics and approaches. We've also published guidance on the BCN policy and again a, a reporting template setting out how to comply, the roles and responsibilities that there are, also setting performance indicators as well. And that was informed with technical support from Verco and UCL, who are helping us develop the public online portal, which should be available shortly. And similar to the whole life cycle carbon guidance, we've published uh, our BC guidance in draft form along with the template that was back in April and will be consulting for a 12 week period, um, which should be towards the end of September. Really interested in uh, stakeholder views to help inform that approach. Um, so really encouraging uh, people to respond and there'll be information on our website about that. So please keep an eye out for that. So that's that's where we are with the London plan currently, um, which I say should be adopted shortly. And it's a, it is a really real step forward for our, our new build policies. And it's a, a much more kind of fully formed approach to, to net zero carbon buildings than, than where we were with the current plan. So just to conclude, um, I thought it'd be worth outlining just what's coming up in this space that will impact on, on planning and our, our net zero carbon policies in the future. So as I've mentioned, there's our um, consultations coming out and our uh, adoption of the London plan. We've also got the part L uh, 2020 in the future home standard response, um, which government said uh, there'll be a response to in the autumn. And um, the mayor was very vocal um, about his opposition to various aspects of that. So we'll be keeping an eye on what's, what comes through there and really considering the impact it has for our policies in London. And we're also working closely with our planning colleagues on the impact of the, the white paper for the planning reforms that will be coming forward and looking at the impact for our environmental policies and net zero carbon in particular. And within our response, really making the case for the need for strong net zero policies um, being set nationally and to align with the UK's net zero carbon target, which can really build on, on the progress that we've made in London. And then finally, um, the mayor has been clear that we need to move faster and uh, take more progress, make more progress in terms of addressing climate action. And he committed to uh, moving London uh, even further on this by committing to a 2030 target for London. And if, he, if he's re-elected, um, that was what he was going to uh, take forward. So uh, there's a huge amount of activity coming up that will influence where we go next and all of this. And just a final point again, just to there's an opportunity now to really inform where we go in London with the, our new policies, um, with the consultations coming up. So I'd really encourage you to, to get involved in those uh, when they're available for comment. Thanks very much. Hello, everyone. Um... We, I apologize for the um, delay sometimes in switching sides between presenters. Thank you very much for coming today. I'm Julie Godfroy, Technical Manager, and I'll give you a very brief introduction to Guidel. It's really only brief and we will have a series of webinars that give more information on particular areas, so stay tuned. I would also like to say a huge thank you to the Guidel steering group and contributing authors. It was a big collective exercise and you'll hear more from them in some of our webinars. So why did we update Guidel? It was first published in 2007 and a couple of years ago, we all thought that it needed a revision, not only to cover technical developments that had happened since, but also to cover and respond to the huge change in context, which makes it clear that we have to drastically change our approach. 
And that really came from simplistically three major areas. One is that, lo and behold, and despite Elon Musk's best efforts, we only have one planet. And as engineers, we need to learn to work within its limits. The second is that um, since the first revision of the guide, the UN published the Sustainable Development Goals. And we thought that was quite a good framework for the revision. It's also starting to be applied by some clients and by some consultants. And we wanted to use that and promote it. And the third, which happened as we were writing um, Guidel, is the IPCC famous 1.5 degree report, which uh, received so much attention and ultimately led to the UK net zero target. So overall, we thought we needed really to insist on these limits, the need for change, and ultimately not only drastically reducing our impacts, but also starting to have positive impacts on the natural environment. In terms of content, it covers what you would expect um, in a building services sustainability guide, so energy, water, carbon, etc. And it focuses on the areas that engineers can directly influence, so operational performance. But it also covers these other areas where we need to collaborate with others and we could have an influence. So, for example, flood risk and sustainable drainage. In addition to the, these technical chapters, we also have the first part of the guide, which is really about why we should care and how to go about it. So the evolving definition of what is a sustainable building, knowing that practice evolves, our understanding of the limits evolves, and how to do regenerative design becomes more and more common. Then we have chapters which cover how we can work as engineers within a team collaboratively on all these topics and how to engage with clients. Now, obviously, this could cover policies and regulations when they are forward looking and you've had great examples from Anne-Marie, but also how to engage more broadly with clients where regulations are not good enough. And that's mostly the case. So, Alexia gave, um, I think, a very good summary of this, and it's very much in line with what Gaidal is promoting. So talking about exposure to climate risk, about the increased expectations from investors on sustainability strategies and reporting, and how engineers can, if they are involved early enough, help create long-term value in a development through sustainability strategies. We then have a series of chapters about how to go about it in engineering terms and how to make building works by embedding performance throughout the project. That covers principles that I'm sure most of you are very familiar with. So a holistic approach, which obviously means that we can't just look at energy and carbon. We also have to look at what that might mean for other impacts, including people. We also have increasingly to think about the building as part of a whole system, obviously in its interaction with the grid, but also increasingly with transport. And then principles um, with reducing demand at the core, not only in energy term, but reducing demand for resources in general, ideally even increasingly moving to questioning the need for a new building altogether and meeting that demand efficiently with low carbon and low impact sources and as much as possible moving towards regenerative approaches. Finally, obviously monitoring and evaluating performance and disclosing it if we can. It really, as you can see, is a very broad topic and the guide is not meant to provide detailed engineering guidance. It's there for strategy, principles and hopefully inspiration. If you want more detail, um, two gateway uh, pieces of guidance are on health and well-being TM40, which was published this year. And on Net Zero, we have a new web page which summarizes all our guidance and key positions. So more on Net Zero. You may know that CBD support the LETI operational 
<coughs> excuse me, net zero carbon definition. So we've created a web page which summarizes the key principles that we advocate, which are very much in line with what you'll see in Guidel. And it also includes a link to relevant pieces of guidance. So you have all in one page what CBZ advise on net zero. On the embodied carbon side, I really recommend you to look at TM56 to reduce embodied carbon in building services. And we'll also have more guidance coming very soon. Finally, we try to include case studies which stretch the envelope throughout the guide. So, for example, you have a building which was deconstructed and rebuilt elsewhere, which almost negated the need for new materials. We have buildings that are zero carbon, or which may even have a positive impact throughout their life. We have case studies of contractual performance target being met an office building that hardly needs any heating and cooling plants, etc., throughout the world. However, there is no doubt that there is a huge gap between the aspiration and what we know we need to achieve, which is the beginning of the guide and the planetary limits, and what is happening now in current or even best practice. So please do send us case studies if you have any and apply obviously for CBZ awards. And I'll now leave you with Clarice who will tell you much more about regenerative design and hopefully inspire you to start bridging that gap. Thank you. Um, good morning, everybody. Thank you very much uh, for being here and a special thank to Dave Sheshu for giving me this opportunity to talk on uh, decision making for regenerative design from a research perspective. So what is regenerative design? I would like to just start by a quick definition of it. So it basically means do less harm, but mainly provide something back to the environment. For instance, put energy back to the grid, increase city drainage potential, adopt a circular economy, etc. How do we go, uh, how do we get there? So as part of the EU cost action restore, rethinking sustainability towards a regenerative economy, we had a week of training different types of designers to work with regenerative design. They had to work through intensive collaboration in a design competition to regenerate the neighborhood of La Luz in Malaga, Spain. And I was given a small grant to go there and observe how they were collaborating and interacting with each other. And four important points came out of this. So the winner team had a fully integrated design project and reasonably sound method to achieve it. Second, all teams intensively used different types of digital simulation tools and made decisions combining them in different ways. Third, the winning project designed beyond buildings, integrating them to the neighborhood and the city, enhancing drainage infrastructure, restoring greenery and promoting urban agriculture. And in addition, they designed affordances for people daily routines in connection with the environment and the city. So let's look at that from uh, research projects. So this uh, first project refers to integrated design by and by mainly discussing that it, it's not necessary, it's not important only to agree on targets and KPIs. We need robust and systemic design methods to coordinate design, to coordinate design decisions from different disciplines. Uh, as design moves from the concept stage to the technical stage, common goals get transformed into specific technical goals, many times in conflict with each other. And for example, a landscape designer who proposes specific types of greenery to configure a quiet sitting area can conflict with a wind expert who, after some wind tests, proves the position of the greenery can increase wind speed to uncomfortable or dangerous levels. So how do we reconcile these different types of technical decisions? Trial and error takes time, so we tend to adopt a view of the wind expert and avoid future liabilities, missing opportunities to find a solution which can work for both. So in this project, we discuss conflict management while designing for urban climate regeneration by transferring a method from product design to building design. We use axiomatic design to control design decisions. Considering wind is a common factor in different simulation models and greenery a common solution to control wind, pollution and promote well-being. We first establish a single acceptable range of wind speeds for all design disciplines to work within. 
containing limits to reduce concentration of pollutants, avoid eye discomfort, prevent snow drifts, and maintain outdoor thermal comforts. And we then direct designers to consult a database with density and permeability of different green belt configurations to attenuate wind speed. Finally, we assess the probability to best match explicit tolerance for wind speed with tolerance to afford greenery. So in this second project, integrated design, we see integrated design calls for robust uh, workflows to record and transfer best practice in site and design assessment. This is especially beneficial when we try to solve difficult problems, such as the one of building back better after disasters. In this case, we have to design temporary buildings to accommodate displaced populations before full regeneration is achieved. This temporary stage needs a fast planning and design response with no time for detailed analysis and assessment. So, using Jupyter Notebooks, we developed a series of automated multidisciplinary workflows which connect different types of data sets and tools including crowdsource and free open access web data to reduce issues related to data ac accessibility, photogrammetry and 3D point clouds facilitating data reach through remote surveys, machine learning directly applied to spatial data to extract and classify configuration of patterns, and space syntax and environmental analysis tools to analyze indoor outdoor relationships in parallel. They are multi-temporal as they look at how the city adapts to the different disaster phases from before the strike to the recovery phase, and also completely multi-scale, going beyond buildings up to the city and the region. So, next slide. Uh, we reuse and transfer parts of the previous workflows to a different context to analyze large quantities of data to produce guidelines for public authorities to develop and implement regenerative school buildings in Egypt. So Egypt is a seismic country subject to regular mild earthquakes. So the government has developed four earthquake-proof building typologies for schools, which are widely used throughout the country. But there is no clear rationale to design a best match between a building type and a given school site with regards to environmental conditions. So excessive solar radiation added to high diurnal temperatures result in the overheating of classrooms and schoolyards, keeping children indoors during school breaks and affecting their well-being. So instead of looking at the buildings, we look at the sites. We assess their conditions to host schools in the different climatic regions of Egypt considering accessibility through walking, cycling, and road safety conditions on the way to school, and environmental comfort potential in relation to solar radiation, daylight, and temperatures in the schoolyards. We use automated digital workflows to facilitate data collection by extracting data from the web and governmental platforms, connect space syntax tools to environmental analysis tools to run multi-domain simulations, and attempt to categorize sites into classes using machine learning methods to test the potential of these classes to afford better uses for schoolyards when hosting governmental building typologies. Next slide. Finally, I would like to discuss the design of end user affordances through the development of self led housing energy retrofits in rural China. Energy renovation is a key policy to reduce carbon emissions in China but is mainly implemented in a top-down manner with the government subsidizing retrofits tailored to urban dwellings. Governmental retrofits are seen by rural communities as inappropriate to their settlements and, uh, and ways of life because villagers directly are involved in the construction of their houses and retrofit them regularly, fulfilling their own aspirations and sharing their experiences. So to develop measures which work in rural contexts, we need strong buy-in from end users. And then I refer back to Alexia when she was talking about the client perspective. So working in close collaboration with the community of Guantin Village in Shanxi province, we will co-design energy retrofit measures tailored to them using creative interactions with end users and energy simulations. These interactions will explore their knowledge potential to generate design ideas and to capture daily and hourly profiles of their aspirations, feelings, and dreams to feed our simulations and quality assure the process. The end user profiles will be disseminated through IA Annex 79, sharing best practice on using occupancy profiles to make design decisions, which enable ways of life to respond to end user aspirations. And finally, I'd like to finish with the synthesis of what I believe are the four important components of decision-making for regenerative design. First, 
We need robust and systemic methods to better deal with technical conflicts and risk management, which are one of the main pitfalls of integrated design. Second, we need to embrace the, the digital revolution, develop transferable workflows, working beyond information modeling and parametric design. We need to go beyond buildings and design them integrated to the neighborhood and city. And finally, we need to properly engage with the end user expert panel as we design to enable ways of life and aspirations. Thank you very much for watching and please contact me for questions. Thank you, Chloe. That was excellent. Thank you. Really interesting. Um, I, so, yeah, so following that, I just want to talk a little bit about um, uh, some examples of how we can move to more regenerative design and, and this idea of having a buildings having a positive impact on the planet uh, rather than always being slightly less bad or, or just being sort of slightly less damaging. Um, and I think my, um, oh, I've just got a few examples and I think sort of picking up on some some themes around things that we, we talked a little bit about in, in Sibsi, Sibsi Guide L, um, where, where I was um, uh, fortunate enough to be asked to be the, um, the, the steering group, um, the, the chair of the, the technical committee on the steering group. And, and uh, I helped pull, uh, pull all the material together that we got from, from all, the, all the various uh, people that were involved in, in, in the, the committee. Uh, and I think, you know, the first thing for me is really um, sort of this thinking in systems and this idea that we need to look at not just the building, but we need to look at the infrastructure that supports that both upstream and, and downstream of, of the building. And that's the downstream bit, something we often don't, we forget about or ignore. Uh, and also the ecosystems that are, are supporting us uh, and, and all the other um, creatures on the planet uh, that, that give us the fresh air and the fresh water and everything that we, we need to survive. Uh, and I think secondly, it's really about mapping that some of those resource flows are thinking about those upstream things that are coming into the building but what, what else is what is leaving the building and and and, and what we we would classify as waste actually could be and should be a resource uh, and we should look at it that way and lastly that holistic approach and and you know we're, we're so drilled in the way that we think that we think as engineers engineers think about the engineering and the architects about the the architecture and uh, we, we're not very good at, at, at thinking uh, outside our own our own disciplines and it is difficult but I think we, we need to start thinking much more broadly uh, and I think um, e even in the in the, the sort of sustainability and the environment field we've been drilled into thinking about uh, topics energy water waste materials uh, you know ecology and transport and all the rest but actually maybe that's a mistake as well maybe we need to be thinking about all of those collectively and, and they're all interlinked and how they're related so i just want to talk a little bit about some of those uh, as examples now so let's just um whoops so so let's let's start with let's start with toilets so uh so uh you know toilets have been around uh, with a pretty similar we design them the same way that uh, for over 150 years now and and we're doing the, basically the same thing which is we which seems you know uh, amazing really what we're doing is 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 capturing all this all this water um water uh collecting it treating it transporting it getting into our buildings and it's drinkable quality and most buildings in in the in the uk have have a source of of potable water and then and then out of all that water we probably drink less than 10 percent of it uh, and and, and that, including cooking and everything else and the rest of it's been used for for non-potable reasons and and you know worst of all 40 percent of it we're flushing down the toilet in the process mixing it with with feces and urine and with uh, bleach and paper and goodness knows what else uh, and then we're having to sort of treat it at the, the back end and you know we're, we're all very efficient at doing this and it's a very efficient in terms of carbon emissions not very efficient in terms of of water as a precious resource and 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 all the other resources that are, are actually coming out um of or, or um fr from the system and, and you know of course and we've, we're seeing you know i've seen sort of examples of where you know sewage has been leaking into into um water courses and, and rivers and things and so you know so it's so it's thinking a bit differently and i think what, what one way we can do that is to is to look at <clears throat> some of the nutrients that come out of so you know urine is a, is an amazing uh, um nutrient rich uh, uh resource and actually we're currently mining um uh, for phosphates, which we, we use in the agriculture industry, and and busy, you know, tearing big holes in in in, in across the planet where where we're uh, open cast mining and, and getting the resource. And actually, urine is a valuable source of uh, um, nitrates, phosphates, potassium, all sorts of all sorts of good stuff that is is good good for plants. 
Um, so what could we do differently? So this is, I mean, this is pretty radical, but I just wanted to put this up there that actually this is actually happening in a building in um, in Seattle. This is the Bullet Center <clears throat> where they have installed uh, composting toilets. Now this isn't the sort of thing you'd find in a in a um, in a Canadian um, forest or, uh, you know, like a, a long drop. This is a, a, a pretty high tech system that doesn't smell and works really well. It uses only 4% of the water that a conventional toilet would use. And, and what you get out the, the back is you get, you get um, compostable material. Uh, and so actually it turns into, so the solids turn into compost that they then use up the road on a, on a rose garden to provide the, the nutrients for that. Um, and, and then also the, um, this is another example. This is the Dublin Rediscovery Center, which is a fantastic project, which I was fortunate enough to go and see when I was doing a talk there. Uh, and they have, um, they have a, comp a, a, a composting toilets as well. Uh, and they use the waste water to um, dilute it down and they use it to grow uh, um, hydroponic plants. I think it's a fantastic idea. But you can even go further than that. Not only are you treating on site and, and, and turning these into benign materials on site um, and creating you know, positive outcomes, but actually you can use urine uh, in microbial fuel cells, which researchers in uh, the University of West of England are doing, and there's a few others around as well, who are actually basically generating electricity from 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 urine so it's 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 turning it's turning that that urine into a a source of fuel that that then generates some electricity and this in this case they use it to to um light the toilets at night so uh, uh, and it's been used in um some um places around the world where where they haven't got any electricity for example um so that's one example i think you know which is just sort of different approach to to how we can think about uh, buildings and, and waste and, and nutrients and all the rest. And the other thing, the, the other interesting example, I think, is is air. And actually, that you know, I think the pandemic and the and the the radical reduction in in and in in car traffic and and the the improvement in air quality has just given uh, I, people are just and designers particularly just a little glimpse of uh, of how it could be in the future where we have all electric cars and and we get rid of all the pollutants and we could get to the point where we could be naturally ventilating again in the cities and and opening windows and and actually in, enjoying the outside environment uh, and also that i think if in that case we could we could stop having to torture the air so much by polluting it but also by having to 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 drive it through uh incredibly tight duckway through pinch points and ramming it through filters and all the rest to get it into into the space where we actually want to use it and where to 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 breathe um and i thought this was a really interesting case study is where is where they've gone a really holistic view and said look we've got lots of greenhouses all around the world um, that we're using to grow crops and having to heat those. And then we've got lots of buildings that are rejecting heat and, and, and uh, in certain times of the year and, and using loads of energy in the process. <clears throat> and wondering whether we can join the two up and actually have a, a symbiotic relationship between uh, growing uh, the, the, the food and the, and the plants that we, we need and, and locally as well, and, and actually dealing with the, the wastes out of buildings. So, so, you know, this building is, is obviously um, the, it's giving away, giving off warm, moist air that's been breathed and hopefully CO, slightly CO2 rich air, which then is really good for the, for the, um, uh, for the plants. And then in turn, the plants are reoxygenating re re and, and helping. And I think they're starting to look at whether they can actually uh, recirculate the air back into, into, into the uh, spaces. And that's, it's all experiments. So they're doing some tests on that, but they've shown some pretty radical reductions in, in energy use for, for a, a system. And the good thing is you've got two systems working so you can actually optimize those 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 systems and, and and then you've got city farms as well and 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 you're actually growing growing crops here so that's really it i just wanted to just leave with this idea that one this is one thing that we're doing in um uh in our new york office where we've actually used hydroponic plants um and and we're doing um a phytoremediation which is basically running air through the roots of the plants it doesn't work very well for the leaves but if you run it through the roots and it the roots are exposed in these these plants then you can actually use that to capture um particulates and pollutants in um uh, in the air and obviously re-oxidating re and stuff as well. So actually we're improving the, the quality of the air at, um, through um, natural means. And I think it'd be really amazing if we could we could think of ways that we could turn our buildings uh, into positive impacts and, and maybe, maybe in the future we'll have um, plants in our plant rooms instead of plant. Uh, I'll leave you with that idea. Thank you for your attention.
Amazing. Thank you so much for a number of you know really interesting and and I think th thought provoking presentations. So I'll invite all the panelists to come back on the the webcam so we can see um, all of your faces. And um, just a note of thanks also to to the audience for sending through so many questions, which you know we'll struggle to get through if I'm honest. But I'll try and pick out a few, and um, we can always take them offline. We'll, we'll record these, and uh, there'll be an opportunity to address them um, at a later date. But I think um, one of the topics I'll start with, and which has um, kind of cropped up a few times through some of the questions is again coming back to this idea of collaboration and I'll probably start with Anne-Marie. Um, one of the questions being are you planning to align with existing standards and guidance on the topic and collaborate with relevant institutions and perhaps further local authorities to maximize consistency and impact of the whole life carbon assessments and then on a similar level I'll then pass on to Dave and Julie perhaps because from, from SIPSI's perspective how much are you reaching out to other professional groups and to other um, in, uh, industry professionals to disseminate the findings that you've just spoken about. Dan Marie, I'll point to you first and I'll let Julie and David take over. Sure. So with the whole life cycle carbon policy, uh, you know, we're very aware that we're we're not starting from scratch here. And you know, there are there are methodologies and approaches out there and experts. So in uh, developing our approach to how to comply with the policy, uh, we set up a, a stakeholder working group uh, to bring in experts, uh, including developers, energy consultants, sustainability professionals, to talk through uh, the approach that we were developing. And the guidance that we've ended up with has been very much informed by that. It uh, is certainly in reference to and aligns quite closely with the, the RICS methodology, as well as British standards. Um, and I think the fact that we, you know, we've got the consultation out there as well. So again, we're really, well, shortly we will. So uh, that is also another opportunity for industry to get involved in, in where this is heading. Say to Julie, I think. Yeah, um, so very good question. And yes, absolutely. I mean, the um, guy, guy Dell really talks about that a lot. Uh, we even sometimes had to remember that this was a guide primarily for building services engineers because we tended to want to talk too much about other things, but we really tried to stress um, the need for collaboration. More generally, um, because I've, I saw a couple of questions like that in the chat, um, what SIBSI are doing at the moment is working a lot with others, including the RBA, RIGS, the ISTRUCT, etc. So in particular, we are in many cross-industry groups to try to share our messages, align our guidance where possible. Um, we're also working on creating a cross-industry sustainability curriculum which would be common to all the professional institutions and ultimately hopefully influence educational degrees as well. We are also, as part of this cross-industry group, it was pretty clear we needed a client guide and um, that has received a steer from a few of the professional institutions and Letty are currently drafting it. There's a consultation if you're interested, but if you want to know more about what we're doing with all sorts of people to try to encourage collaboration. Uh, have a look at the CBZ Climate Action Plan, which is online and which shows you where also, for example, we work with academics on research projects, etc. Amazing, thanks for that. Uh, one for Anne-Marie. So in primary, be lean component of sustainable design, to what extent is passive design being prioritized? And I think that's really coming from the point of view that the future of the London air quality is changing and what does that, what does that mean in terms of openable windows and the way that we design our buildings? I don't know if you have any comments on that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, no, that's, that's critical. That's really important. Um, and it also links to um, sort of the overheating aspect as well. Um, so uh, we have a, a policy on that um, in, the, in the London plan. Couldn't cover absolutely everything in the presentation, but um, our policy around managing heat risk actually addresses a lot of this. Um, with uh, proposals coming forward, really needing to minimise impacts on the urban heat iron effect through design, layout, orientation, and our cooling hierarchy really uh, promotes at the top of it the need to um, you know, look at orientation, look at shading, um, as well as insulation, provision of green infrastructure with uh, sort of mechanical uh, systems very much kind of towards the end of that. So we really want to see passive measures uh, looked at first. I think you know there are some kind of 
design constraints and you know uh, sort of you know how buildings look there are you know uh, can be opposition to thing putting things like shading on a building which I think is something that we you know that we need to overcome but certainly you know what we're trying to promote is those passive measures uh, before you know uh, active cooling and air conditioning is is considered great thanks and I think Clara it's for you um, there's a question about do we need to embrace a new architecture for our commercial and institutional buildings to get rid of the glass box um, glass block architecture um, I don't I don't uh, want to 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 label different architecture styles I think that is not uh, really the point I think the point is to get integrated solutions and to try and put all the professionals that are working together towards achieving that integrated solution which means instead of having collages of different technical solutions to try and have like uh, some solutions that kills three four five rabbits with a single stone and uh, that potentially address well as best as possible and user behaviors and aspirations about how do they want to use the building not only how do they currently use the building so that we are not responsive but we are also uh, uh, like preventive in a way and um, I do believe in integrated design contract and integrated project design because I think that's the only way to get there but I wouldn't like to label solutions uh, maybe the glass box has its place in a specific climate for a specific context and depending a lot on the specific urban surroundings which we are not really carefully looking at therefore the, the project we have about the sites in, in in Egypt to, to really understand site potential that is a downplayed feature of design. Be good for growing plants in the grass plants anyway. <laughs> That's a good point and I think David I think I've got one for you here which is um, meeting the aspirations voiced um, has major practical challenges and so something has to give potential occupant expectations on space conditions for example. So what is the panel's view and I'll start with Dave but then open it up to the, to the wider panel about how um, policies table the impact or how can we adjust occupancy behaviors which drive expectations and often limit the ability to reduce emissions? So again, I think it's going back to tenant landlord collaboration. How do we break down the expectations of our tenants um, to really to start meeting the, the operational efficiencies that, that we're looking to achieve? That's probably a good one for you to answer, actually, Alexia, isn't it? Because I think I think the uh, you know the, the, the you're getting a, you're getting sounds like you're getting a lot of push from from tenants actually to to do more and and to 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 and and there seems to be certainly on the commercial sector a, a strong drive from from the, the the corporates to particularly to to have buildings that are net zero and are doing more. So yeah, you're absolutely something always has to give, and 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 I think this is, but I think what's interesting about you know integrating. Um, biodiversity and um, all the sort of things I was talking about into, into buildings means that actually you, you, you're probably providing a better environment anyway for occupants and potentially and, and dealing with the health and well-being aspect as well but you know, also ultimately we're going to have to something you know something's going to give if we've got amazing buildings but the planet is completely trashed we're not really going to be <laughs> it's not really any point is there? <laughs> so um, that's my view. <laughs> yeah Julie please go ahead. Thank you. Um, yes, I mean, I I really think there are more synergies between trying to achieve good comfort and trying to achieve good energy performance. It's not only that I wish it was the case, it's that we know for decades of feedback from post-occupancy that people like to have some level of comfort that is quite useful in control terms. You don't need to control to tight bands, as we know. Some comfort is useful. Case studies of really low energy buildings often show that actually they have mechanical ventilation and heat recovery in the winter for efficiency, but in the summer they tend to be mixed mode and benefit from natural cooling and natural ventilation. Really the the idea that some level of user control helps people be more tolerant uh, is really, really important. And I think we focus too much on the potential conflicts without realizing all the synergies. And that's just on comfort. Um, as Alexia said, the opportunities for collaboration are also a massive chance to address both energy and people. Amazing, thanks. 
Um, there's one question here, which I think I would love to know the answer to, because it would make my, my life a lot easier in my job. But um, are there any golden rules for designing building services for achieving net zero carbon buildings? And are these within any guidance, for example, part L? Um, and I suppose a, a, a related <coughs> question being what type of technologies and products should be specified more in buildings when trying to achieve the new levels of, of regulation that are coming in? Um, so I'll open it up to, to whoever wants to take that one. I'm not sure we can do that in five minutes, can we? <laughs> well, if you can, well, then you. Um, you want to start, well, though? Yeah, go for it, Julian. No, no, go, start, go ahead. Um, well, I, I, yeah, I, mean, I think, I think um, Guidel tries to set out some, some ideas. Um, I, I mean, I don't think there's anything particularly new in it. I, you know, I think we have to, we have to look at, um, as I say, the, the holistic view of not just the building, but beyond the building. And I think that that's, that's something that's coming out from the GLA as well. Um, Cause I've been talking about, about three, three red lines that we need, we need to cross. One is that we can't think about the red line of the building anymore. We've got to be thinking about whether we can get heat from elsewhere outside of the, of the, the building. We need to be thinking about landlord and tenant collaboration. And then that line between the landlord and the tenants is, is hugely problematic if we're going to go net zero and beyond. Uh, and I, I think we, we, we we're either just going to have to find ways to collaborate better with tenants and, and, and landlords or, or we're just going to have to completely rethink the whole thing and just just get rid of that crazy line that we've got where where we where, where you know we, we put a load of stuff in and then a tenant comes in and rips half of it out and then and then runs the building uh says that we want the building running 24 hours a day when actually they probably don't and then the landlord's left there with with a huge energy bill and uh, or, a, or a co2 emissions for the whole building that's massive so that's something we're going to have to work really hard on and i think the third one is the line between the um the the, the handover that, that 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 red line where no no designer or um uh, constructor constructor wants to cross which is into the operation <laughs> right we're gone we're out of here we've done we've built the building it's handed over see you later good luck and i think you know that 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 sort of through soft landings and design for performance and all these ideas we need to we need to be still involved post handover and equally the the prospective tenants of buildings need to and operators need to be involved at the design stages so i think if there's a sort of golden rules i think for a start those three red lines need to be crossed that's pretty good. I think we're, we're shortly running out of time. Oh, yeah, go on, Julie. Never mind. I will just add that the um, the golden rule I think that comes out in most of guidance and CBZ guidance in general is use less, reduce demand first um, before even thinking about the technologies that might meet that demand. And Gaidel makes it very clear that we have to move away from this idea that there's diminishing returns. There's actually projects that show that if you push it further, at some point, you very often can get to the point where you get rid of plants, suddenly. Um, and with passive design, you see that there's such low demand that you could almost need hardly any heating. We have to get in where we can, and especially on new build, to these points where we remove the need for plants or we drastically reduce it because we will then save not only operational carbon, but also peak pressure on the grid and obviously embodied carbon in the plant itself. Um, so yeah, I think that's what I wanted to add. Thank you so much. And I think, I mean, given given the time, I'm going to take a relatively uncontroversial question potentially, or just may, maybe more straightforward into Anne-Marie, because there's been quite a few questions coming in about offsetting and the price change and about whether those are being channeled specifically into sustainability initiatives and typically the fact that we've got, you know, a housing stock or a, a building stock that really does need a lot of retrofit measures. So how are the increase, how is the increased price of carbon um, for the GLA going to be um, used for those purposes? Yes, that's right. So those uh, contributions are secured through Section 106 and they are very much ring fenced for carbon saving measures uh, with each borough in London individually setting up their, their carbon offset funds um, in order to do that. Um, we also have uh, published our sort of principles around what we think it, it should be spent on, although the boroughs do have um, you know, room for, for innovation around that. Um, but our focus very much has been, you know, focus on the retrofit uh, side of things, whether that's, you know, the council stock, um, social housing, um, and we've, you know, I think there are a lot of great examples out there of boroughs who are putting together really, really interesting programs linking um, their retrofit programs to, to fuel poverty, uh, lots of programs around putting soda PV on schools. Um, so we do have some, some case studies available that we've, we've published. Um, 
you know, there is a, you know, there's a, you know, a good pot of money coming in now around that. So I think the focus really needs to be on spending it. And there's a lot of activity in boroughs, particularly now they're, you know, declaring climate emergencies and really using this funding to help to help uh, challenge that, uh, to meet that challenge. We're actually um, got a survey uh, out at the moment with boroughs to get more updated information on, on how the money's being spent. So there's kind of regular monitoring as to where that money's going um, and looking at, you know, how we can better support boroughs in terms of spending it. Amazing. Well, I think that now calls the time. So thank you so much to all the panelists for their time today and thank you all for joining. Um, for the questions that we didn't have the time to, to address, there will be there will, these will be sent to the panelists. Um, but thank you really for your engagement and thank you to Sibsi and ACOM for, for hosting this. And I'll just leave you with um, an encouragement to go and check out the guide and see um, what you can get out of it. But I think it, it really is really useful to, to encourage better design and to think beyond the boundaries. So have a lovely day and thank you everyone. Thanks everyone. Thank you.